Uh, good morning, everyone. We're, we're going to kick off pretty well on time, I think. Uh, you're all very welcome. My name is Barry McMullen. I'm from DCU. And together with Professor Mike Jones from Trinity, we are the co-PIs on the EPA-funded project, IE Nets, investigating the potential for negative emissions technologies in Ireland. Uh, and the project is really just started a few months ago. Um, this is a, a public launch event, the purpose of which is to give an opportunity for the people that we hope might be interested in the outputs, we don't have any outputs yet, but people who might be interested in the outputs, um, to alert you to the fact that the project is happening, to give you an opportunity to find out a bit more about it, uh, and to give you an opportunity perhaps to you know, refine exactly what we're going to do. The basic uh, structure of the project is already um, laid down in the proposal agreed with the EPA, but as always with research projects, there's space to refine uh, exactly the direction we take as the project unfolds, depending on uh, the particular things we discover in our research. So it's an opportunity to help us steer uh, that unfolding of the project. A couple of the usual administrative announcements. Um, there are emergency exits there, and uh, you can also go out that way in the unlikely event of an er emergency. We hope there won't be one. Uh, we are attempting, <clears throat> excuse me, attempting to record this. So just so you're aware, um, if the recording works, anything you say here may be taken down and used against you in the future. Um, so apologies for that. Uh, it does mean when we get to the Q&A sessions, uh, we have a couple of roving microphones. We'll ask you to use a microphone. Uh, you won't actually hear it coming out through the speakers, a small enough room we should be able to hear each other, but we do ask you to use the microphone so that we capture it on the recording. Okay? Um, the, uh, we are hoping to have, uh, as our keynote contribution to the morning, Dr. Sabina Fuss um, from the Maria Cater Institute um, in Germany. Uh, she is actually, I mean, she's not physically here, we'll, we'll be bringing her in on Skype in due course. She's actually attending another event in Germany today, so she's taking time out to join us. Um, there, there is some slight uncertainty about the quality of the Wi-Fi connection where she's at, um, so we'll see how well that works out, but we have a fallback. So we actually, she very kindly recorded her keynote in advance, so we're actually going to play the recording and by the time we get to the end of the recording, hopefully um, she will be online and will be able to have the Q&A. But that's another reason why uh, we will ask you for that Q&A to use the microphones, because if you don't use the microphones, Sabine on the other end won't actually be able to hear what you're saying. Okay, um, so with that said, <clears throat> the first item on the, the program this morning, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Frank McGovern, uh, the Chief Scientific Officer advisor, director of the Environmental Protection uh, Agency in Ireland. So we asked Frank to give us uh, an overview, uh, a quick overview of the EPA climate research program because of course our project today is funded through that climate research program. So I, I just thought it would be a good idea if Frank could give us some overarching context for that. So, um, if I can get Frank's presentation in, if you want to come up, Frank, thank you. And I'm going to ask you to take this mic and just stick it on your tie there. It's very high tech. Yeah, I think my current. Great. Okay. I think my current title, I think, is Chief Climate Scientist with the EPA, but. Uh, I'm not really that into titles. Uh, what I, thanks, Barry, and uh, obviously this is a very interesting project uh, for us uh, in, in many ways in terms of how we look at the challenges that we're facing in climate change. Barry just asked me to give a short introduction on the EPA climate program or research program. Um, most of you will already be very familiar with this, so I'll be very brief. The EPA has a statutory role to coordinate climate or environmental research in Ireland. Um, 
for a number of years it has worked in the format that we, we look at the challenges, the environmental challenges under three pillars. Uh, the sustainability pillar, which is a very broad pillar, the water pillar, which is a very focused pillar, and the climate pillar, which is, a, is an outreach type of pillar because we engage very strongly with other agencies and bodies. And while the EPA leads on developing climate change research activities in Ireland, a lot of other bodies are doing there as well, and we try to work with them. The way we try to work with them is a structure uh, CCRP, Climate Change Research Pillar. The structure that we devised some years back has provided, been very effective. Uh, we have broken this challenge up into four thematic areas. We have a coordinating group which comprises primarily of research funders and users, so from the various departments, from government agencies, and um, the way we looked at it is the key issues are the greenhouse gas uh, emissions and sinks, and how to manage these in terms of achieving mitigation goals. So we, that thematic area is very much focused on the inventory system and how to improve the inventory system so that we can incorporate the, the key elements and improve the reporting from Tier 1, which is the, the default tiers, to Tier 3, uh, which would be uh, national, uh, scientifically based uh, national modelling uh, approaches to, to certain categories. Uh, theme two then would be climate change, future climate change, its impacts and adaptation options. So again, that's looking at the other element of the climate change challenge. What is Ireland's going to, climate going to be like in the future, 2050, 2100, and in the more shorter term, and how will we respond to that in terms of uh, addressing issues such as changing weather patterns, sea level rise, ecosystem change, all of which will have impacts on our um, society and economy. The third issue, the third theme then is socio-economic analysis and technologies and that is really the solution space and the solution space is envisioning what Ireland will be like in 2050 and how the pathways to achieve that. It's been very influ influential and did I think contribute to the <laughs> formation of the national policy in this area and the sort of issues there we've been looking at how to get to uh, uh, net neutrality for Ireland by 2050, and we fund a lot of work, say, in UCC, Brino Gallicor's activities in, in, in relation to energy modelling, and also that, that also brings in the challenges, what will Ireland also look like in terms of the adaptation challenge in 2050. And of course, this particular project here is, it is, comes under that thematic area because, as we know, there are major mitigation challenges and how, to, how we will address them, we may, in fact, quite likely will need negative emissions, significant negative emissions, uh, but we'll be talking about that later on. The other area that we cover as well is transboundary air pollution. That is air pollution, essentially. Air pollution here gets transported elsewhere. Air pollution elsewhere is transported here across transatlantic from Europe. And there is obviously synergies between the sources of air pollution, which is mainly combustion, but also agriculture gives rise to a considerable amount of air pollution as well. And uh, the air, air pollutants interact with the radiation balance as well through, uh, uh, through reflecting sunlight, sulfate particles, uh, for instance, and interacting with clouds and changing cloud albedo. We have, uh, we look at data management and communications as a joint research activity. So for instance, we've set up a climate information platform to integrate data and information from theme two on impact so that, that we, we can get access to all of that information online. And uh, we're also looking at developing infrastructure and the ICOS, ICOS Ireland, which would look at uh, flux measurements of greenhouse gases and atmospheric measurements of greenhouse gases would be one of those issues. So I suppose the carbon budget issue is the key issue here, and this is, I just will finish on this slide. It's, it's from the fifth assessment report, and essentially what it shows is the, the issue is cumulative emissions of CO2 in the atmosphere, because CO2 uniquely accumulates in the atmosphere and interacts with our terrestrial and ocean systems. What the AR5 did is they showed that the, these cumulative emissions will eventually determine 
what the global temperature will be because these will last for centuries to millennia as, as they build up in the atmosphere. Um, and they link this to the change in the global temperature there in the y-axis. So you can see Paris Agreement pointed between 1.5 and 2 degrees essentially as the, the window, the landing window or the landing site for global climate action. You can just go across there to see the, the budget range that exists for those two uh, temperature goals. And that budget range, I suppose, is determined by issues such as the, the climate sensitivity, how the actual Earth systems respond to the additional radiative forcing from CO2. So at a global level, we have a fair idea of what the budgets are. Now, I know there's recent work or recent issues which suggest that the climate sensitivity might be one degree, which would actually be very good news because it actually allow us uh, more time to address this issue, but we could not, that, that's lower than the, the range that IPCC has said. We'll have to see what the IPCC comes up with in six assessment report, but right now this is the basis by which policy will be worked out at a, at a global level. Uh, if the sensitivity is lower, that just gives us some extra decades by which in terms of achieving net zero carbon dioxide because essentially regardless of uh, what we're doing in climate policy, we do have to get to net zero and then probably these negative emissions to offset any overshoots in terms of CO2. And also that does not take account of the non-CO2 greenhouse gases which are obviously very important. Methane is a very potent greenhouse gas, N2O is as well. So that, that atmospheric space, if I may use that, term needs to accommodate not just CO2 but the other greenhouse gases but without doing CO2 we are in deep difficulty and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay so um, so uh, I, I should have outlined the program for the morning so thank you very much to Frank for that introduction to the EPA research program. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit about the background of the project and uh, of our specific project uh, and some specific features that it has. Around about 11 o'clock we're going to switch over to the uh, recorded keynote from Sabina Fuss uh, and then we'll have the Q&A with her. Following that um, we're going to present and my colleagues on, on the research team, who I'll introduce in a moment, will present more detail about the specific activities that we're going to do uh, within the project. I should say Dr. Fuss's presentation will really be giving you the context from a global perspective, from a global point of view, what are the issues and what is the thinking in relation to the need for, the opportunity for, or the dangers of um, relying on negative emissions technologies. Broadly, that means, at the moment, the only technologies we have are positive emissions technologies. They're things that um, deliberately or accidentally release greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, some of which accumulate for very long times, particularly CO2. Negative emissions, conversely, negative emissions technologies would somehow pull greenhouse gases back out of the atmosphere and put them somewhere safe. Uh, which is another part of the jigsaw there. Um, so the, the Paris Agreement uses this terminology of, of achieving a balance between positive emissions and negative emissions in the second half of the century, that that, that would be essential. Um, but that doesn't mean that negative emissions are only an issue for the second half of the century, uh, because as long as we've got any positive emissions, certainly of CO2, then we have to have some things that are also sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere in, in order to achieve net zero um, globally. And, and in fact, to get onto a trajectory, the sort of trajectories uh, to, to get to the atmospheric concentrations that, that Frank was outlining there that would be consistent with the Paris Agreement temperature goals, then the rate at which we would have to reduce particularly CO2 emissions is extremely challenging. So even between now and 2050, uh, we possibly, arguably, have to start deploying uh, negative emissions technologies simultaneously 
so that although we don't get to zero until the second half of the century on a global basis, the positive amount is less than it otherwise would be. Anyway, as I say, Dr. Fuchs's presentation will give that uh, global context in more detail for you. So just to give the background to um, the, the, the project team and the project itself, uh, so this is us, so you've met me, um, Mike uh, is sitting up here, uh, Mike is our host here in the Department of Botany in Trinity College Dublin. Um, we both uh, were attendees at uh, a public talk uh, in the spring of last year at the Royal Irish Academy given by Professor Kevin Anderson of the UK Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research, um, at, at which Kevin Anderson was essentially presenting his thoughts post-Paris. So this was the spring of 2016, the Paris Agreement had been signed, uh, or well, the text had been adopted in December 2015. Uh, so he was giving us his, his reflections on, on what that all meant. And in, in very crude, compact summary, uh, it was this, you know, the good news and bad news. The good news was that, in a sense, against all the odds, we had a new global, essentially unanimous agreement uh, by all the parties to the UN Framework Convention on, on Climate Change. That agreement had some extremely strong things in it, preeminently the articulation of the temperature goals. Um, and, and, and there's two, the language we'll look at a bit later, but there, there's essentially two goals there to uh, definitely keep the global average temperature uh, increase well below two degrees over pre-industrial, pre two degrees Celsius over pre-industrial, well below, not just about two degrees, but well below two degrees, and to take action to try and limit it to 1.5 degrees. Okay. Um, so that, that's actually a more aggressive temperature target than had been under discussion uh, prior to that, certainly at EU level, and, and the EU uh, did play a leadership role through the early 2000s in articulating what the global temperature target should be. Uh, and prior to that, the, the sort of bare two degrees limit was what was in the frame. But by Paris, uh, with the IPCC fifth assessment report in hand, knowing that the uh, risk assessment of the potential dangers of progressively uh, greater temperature increase had hardened significantly. Okay, it's a credit to the parties uh, at COP21 in Paris that they adopted um, that, that more stringent temperature goal of well below two degrees. Uh, to limit the potential risk effectively. So lots of good things in the Paris Agreement in that respect. Less good things, um, the actual instruments to achieve those aspirations uh, are much less clear. The design of the Paris Agreement, because this is what was politically possible, the design of the Paris Agreement is bottom-up, it's not top-down, unlike the Kyoto Protocol, its predecessor in a sense. The design of, of Paris is bottom-up, it relies on the parties to the agreement voluntarily <coughs> engaging in <coughs> their own contributions to this overall requirement to meet these temperature goals. And as uh, an input to that, uh, prior to the COP21 meeting, all the parties, more or less all the parties uh, to the UNFCCC submitted their voluntary nationally determined contributions or intended nationally determined contributions. Now that the Paris Agreement is in force, they're no longer intended, they are statements of nationally determined contributions, but nationally determined. It's not that the UNFCCC or the Paris Agreement is telling parties or, ma or states, parties to the agreement, what they have to do. The parties are voluntarily asserting what they're willing to do. Uh, and and they, they have uh, made you know, very significant commitments, in, including, certainly back then, including the US, and, and we hope that even the US, despite everything that's currently going on, will uh, hold to and live up to the commitments that it made pre-Paris. 
The difficulty, however, is that when the sums are done on those com commitments pre-Paris, they don't add up to meeting the Paris Agreement temperature goals. They wouldn't even add up really to meeting the bare two degrees. They certainly don't add up to meeting well below two degrees uh, and taking action to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees. So there, there's a challenge there. The parties have signed up and the Paris Agreement is now in force, but the requirement now is for the parties to ratchet up their ambition, to ratchet up their mitigation measures to bring them collectively into line with the Paris Agreement. Okay? And the Paris Agreement lays out a timetable that is quite slow for that. Um, there'll, there'll be a global stock take in 2023. Um, that's, you know, a, a lot will have happened between now and then. Okay? So it, it really is very, very challenging. And because of the long lived nature, particularly of CO2, what we do between now and 2023 is very, very difficult to undo. So to come back to that presentation at the RIA um, by Kevin Anderson, he outlined all of that and he said, basically, when you drill into you know, the, the, the IPCC advice, um, so as, as part of the IPCC process, they review and present and summarize a large set of potential scenarios for mitigating emissions over the rest of this century. And if you pick out the ones that would be consistent with the Paris temperature goals, and you focus in on them, virtually unanimously, they assume that it will be possible to deploy negative emissions technologies at very large scale progressively as the century unfolds, uh, which would be great if we knew for sure we could do it, if we, if we knew for sure they would be affordable. But if any of those things are mistaken, then we can get to 2030, 2040, 2050, and we're completely off in terms of what we need to do. The gases, particularly CO2, has already accumulated in the atmosphere, and the technology that we thought, uh, you know, the, the basis on which we continued emitting, which was that we were going to be able to repair the damage later, doesn't come through. Uh, and, and so there's this moral hazard buried in the combination of the Paris framework and the mismatch of that with the current uh, mitigation commitments mitigation of positive emissions that states have made. Uh, and, and just to say, uh, as far as I am aware, I'm open to contradiction on this, while there's some uh, hypothetical mention of negative emissions in a small number of the nationally determined contributions pre-Paris, none of them make any commitment to actually deploy negative emissions technologies as yet. Uh, however, the IPCC scenarios imply that we're going to do that. Okay, so uh, that was the context. Uh, I say Mike was there, I was there. Um, we had a chat after, Frank was there. Uh, we had a chat afterwards, um, and, and there was general discussion at that meeting. And, and essentially, there were, I suppose, very crudely two points of view. Uh, and I'm, I have to say, torn between both of them. One point of view said, um, well, we really shouldn't be gambling with that. We, we should do research by all means and see if we could make negative emissions technologies work. But in the meantime, uh, the actions we should be taking should be premised on an assumption that they won't work. Because that's the precautionary principle. Because that doesn't dig us into a hole that we don't know whether we'll be able to get back out of. Okay? So that's a very clear, straightforward point of view. However, it would involve countries like Ireland or the EU generally, getting on to a trajectory where CO2 emissions uh, are declining at 5 plus percent a year from this year, every year, from here on. So the, the, the current EU target of 40 percent reductions um, by 2030 
um, you probably in round numbers need to double that. We need to have gone down by 80% by 2030 in order to be on a, an equitable, equity is a big issue here, who should do more, but with reasonable interpretations of equitable, to be on an equitable trajectory uh, of reductions in positive emissions without relying on negative emissions, hypothetical negative emissions, uh, we, we'd have to be doing much more much earlier. And again, if we were to take that seriously at EU level, um, we can't wait till 2023 to start doing it. Because if we wait till 2023, then we wouldn't be talking about 5% per year, we'd be talking about 10% per year. Okay, because the damn stuff is accumulating in the atmosphere. So it's, it's a real bind that we're currently in. Um, sorry, the, the flip side of that was, of, of the discussion at the meeting last year, was to say, well, we're just going to have to make this negative emissions thing work. Okay, and, and we need to roll up our sleeves and we need to get everybody uh, who can contribute to this on board and start working on it. Uh, and Frank and the EPA, uh, to their credit, um, took that message on board and in the research call last year, they offered, I think for the first time, Frank, to uh, specifically fund um, investigation of the, the local potential for negative emissions technologies. Um, and, and Mike and I, uh, put in a proposal and we're successful, so here we are. Um, and, and the point, it's a small project, it's a two year project. We started essentially in February, we finished at the end of next year more or less. Uh, it, it's an exploratory project. <clears throat> it's, to, it, it's not to develop new negative emissions technologies. Um, the, the, the team, we have Alwyn McGeever here, based here as a postdoc here in Trinity, we have Paul Price, a research assistant working with me out in DCU. So it's just the four of us. Um, we're, we're not going to invent new technologies to change the world um, in this 18 months uh, that we have left to us, but we're going to assess what's out there, um, what the ask is on a global basis, what that would potentially mean on an equitable basis for Ireland, how that would stack up against our current plans and our current trajectories. You'd not be surprised to hear it doesn't stack up very well as yet. Uh, I mean, in the same way as, in a sense, there's a tacit implication. You know, if you take the current nationally determined uh, contributions under the Paris Agreement, and you take the Paris Agreement temperature goal, there's a gap. So tacitly, that gap is going to be filled by negative emissions technologies. That's not really being articulated or talked about, but that's the logic of the current situation. That gap has to be filled. But you can pull that back down to a single country like Ireland and you can say, well, we have a plan. Well, we will have a plan in June, uh, the first national mitigation plan under, under our climate legislation. We have uh, a national policy position to 2050, which incidentally is also not compatible with Paris Agreement goals. Um, that's a separate discussion. But we have a plan. We also have projections of what's actually uh, going to unfold at least 2030 or 2035. Um, and there's a gap. There's a gap between um, the projections and our own self-adopted policy position to 2050. There's an even bigger gap between that and what we would have to do to be consistent with the Paris goals. We'll, we'll elaborate that a bit, a bit more later on. But tacitly, silently, that gap is supposed to be filled. I mean, the logic of it is that we here in Ireland will deploy enough. If we're not going to ramp down our emissions faster, then tacitly, uh, what nobody is saying, no politician is saying, no, uh, no, either in government or out of government is saying is that, uh, and that certainly nobody is telling the citizens Oh, incidentally, um, we're, we're going to spend huge amounts of money undoing the damage that we're currently doing um, because we think it's too hard to stop doing the damage that we're currently doing uh, or something like that. So the, the, the project is about trying to map out, well, realistically, how much of that gap might we be able to close and how quickly. And, and of the candidate technologies that are mentioned out there, um, how do they map onto Ireland? Okay, because they have different requirements 
um, for different uh, basic resources and facilities. So what, what's Ireland's ability, capacity, never mind about cost, but just our physical ability or capacity, uh, what kind of deployment would, uh, of negative emissions might best suit Ireland? As I say, we're probably, in a sense, only going to scratch the surface, but at least we hope we'll be able to lay out what, what the uh, landscape is, what the potential options are, um, and, and then policymakers, and more importantly, citizens, uh, we're, we're going to be engaging we understand in a, in a national dialogue on climate action uh, beginning in the next few months, an extended process that will also last two years in the first instance as I understand it. So again, this sort of discussion we hope will be part of that so that people you know, in society as a whole can engage with and understand what the opportunities, the obligations, the responsibilities, the risks, the costs of all of the, the, these things are so that we can all collectively develop a vision that adds up, hopefully, an attractive vision for a positive, flourishing Irish society and global society, but at any rate, a vision that adds up. Um, I'm an engineer, I'm sorry, I like things to add up. Okay, um, I, I say we're, we're going to say more uh, uh, about the project, but we're now going to segue into the presentation from Dr. Fuss. So if you bear with me for a moment, I just have to rearrange things up here.